Welcome to week nine of the Marshan and Oran Sports Media Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshan, sports media columnist for the New York Post. He's John Oran, the media reporter for the Sports Business Journal. And John, this week, no guests, but next week, we've got a pretty good one. Next week, we are doing the big get. Or should we talk about it or should we wait, wait to let it happen? Well, it's scheduled. It's scheduled, so we'll say it. We had Jimmy Bataro, who is uh, ESPN's president. We're going to have a former ESPN president, uh, Steve Bornstein, or as uh, one former executive said to me, it's not born, Bornstein, it's Bornstein, like Frankenstein. <laughs> He's a legend in the business, also led NFL broadcasting uh, when they created the NFL Network, uh, had a big responsibility of Red Zone, et cetera. So that'll be fun next week. This week, though, is just me and you, a lot of topics to hit on. We're going to do who's up, who's down in the second. And then we have uh, NFL, Amazon. Troy Aikman, Chris Collinsworth, ESPN Distribution, ACC Network, MLB Spending Spree, and TV, uh, and the lockout, the whole thing there, and Sean McManus, and then we'll have our calls of the week. So let's get started. Who's up? Who's down? Who's up? Who's down? All right, who's up? I'm not done talking about the Premier League yet, Andrew. I have John Miller the president of programming for NBC Sports Group. Why did the Premier League decide to let NBC renew the deal? Money, of course. I mean, it's uh, it's gonna be six years, $2.7 billion. I mean, that that obviously is reason number one. But reason number two from a lot of people that I talked with comes down to John Miller, a long time uh, NBC executive. Can I describe an executive, a business executive as an unsung hero? But he's the unsung hero of that deal. I will say unsung hero might have been the $2.76 billion, but keep going. (laughs) He has deep relationships, and the $2.7 billion is certainly the main reason, but a lot of people I talked to said that if if Miller wasn't there and the relationships he had weren't as strong as they were, the likelihood of of, uh, the the Premier League leaving is better than not. All right, so John Miller feels good. So who who do you got going down? Going down? John Miller president of programming of NBC Sports Group. He's been at NBC for a long time, since the 1980s. Way back in 1991, he was part of an NBC group that did a really unique deal to bring Notre Dame football, the home football games, to NBC. Well, have you seen the week that, N- that Notre Dame has had? Their ratings this season were abysmal, down 48%. Their coach, Brian Kelly, left. I, I guess he thought he couldn't win a national championship at, at, at Notre Dame. It has not been a good year for Notre Dame football. And one of the architects of that Notre Dame football deal, John Miller. And John Miller, if you're listening, that's the media. They build you up just to tear you down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Andrew, who do you have is up? All right, who's up for me? Now, sometimes you got to just look and say, you got to do the obvious one, the NFL. I mean, the ratings for the NFL are incredible. CBS on Thanksgiving, uh, nearly 40 million people were watching Raiders, Cowboys. It's, uh, it's been since, since the 90s that uh, that many people on Thanksgiving or regular season game have watched uh, the NFL. It's incredible reasons why, you know, you to put your finger on it, it's kind of hard, but I do think the Cowboys being better is, is helpful. You have the star quarterbacks, Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers doing very well. So you have those uh, star attractions in those late windows. Uh, But the NFL, uh, you know, I'm starting to think, we'll talk about this in a minute. Maybe they opt out after seven years. They did those big deals for $110 billion that takes us into the 2030s. But maybe seven years down the road uh, when these deals starts, or I guess we're nine years down the road, uh, maybe they opt out and uh, get some more money because the NFL is the most unstoppable product in TV. It's the most valuable programming there is in, in television, and it's only getting more valuable as, as more people cut the cord. And uh, the people cutting the cord, they're not sports fans. It's the sports fans that are sticking on and watching it. Who do you have is down? All right, again, right in my face, MLB. MLB has this momentum, uh, all these signings, free agency. It's great with the deadline of a lockout. Now, what impact this has on television and the interest in baseball, I'm not positive. You know, they, people always say I'm never going to watch again. And then I think invariably they do come back if they're real fans. But I do think it's really a bad, it's such a bad look. 
I mean, you're, you're spending all this money uh, left and right for these superstars. And now you can't decide how to divide the, the pie. I just don't, that leaves a bad taste in everyone's mouths. And I just think uh, it's a shame that baseball is doing it to himself. So that one's right in your face too. I just, again, nobody likes a lockout, uh, but I just think it's just such a bad look uh, for baseball. So they got my who's down. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about that on this pod and you were optimistic that they were going to start the season on time. Are you still optimistic about that? I do. I do think they will. There's too much money. Things are going too well, even though baseball is always dying. Uh, but uh, I, I do think they start the season on time. Uh, but we will get that. I think that's topic three. John did the topics this week. He has like one A and one B and one C. I don't know what the heck's going on. So we're going to be, we're going to play it by ear a little bit. I wanted to theme them this week. Yeah. All right, we go to topic one. And like I said, John, you got topic one. We have 1A NFL, 1B Amazon, 1C Troy Aikman, Chris Collinsworth. So I see how you have it on the rundown. Where do you want to start NFL overall? What do you, what do you got? You know what? I want to go back to, to the ratings. And I want, to, uh, I want to go to the Thanksgiving ratings because I think that we saw a real sea change this Thanksgiving that we haven't seen before. I want to go back to like 2010 when uh, Fox went to the NFL and said it wanted the Super Bowl champion Saints to play the Cowboys. And the NFL was like, what are you, they thought Fox was crazy. Why do you want to put a really good game on Thanksgiving when people are going to be sitting around and they're predisposed to watching it anyway? And Fox's point was, we already get good, good ratings on Thanksgiving. This is a way to get better ratings. Well, it has come totally full circle now. Before these games, all anybody talked about was how bad the matchups were. You had the Detroit matchup against uh, the Bears, a bad matchup. You had Dallas, a, a premier team, but they're playing the Raiders. It's not a very good matchup. The numbers that we saw in terms of viewership from, from these games will ensure that the matchups on Thanksgiving going forward, at least on the afternoon games, are not going to be top flight uh, rivalry games. They're going to be games that are that that are not you know that are not not fighting to be on Sunday Night Football. I mean, I would suggest to you that Bears Lions game, if it was on a Fox regular Sunday afternoon, it would probably go to 10% of the country. But that's what we're going to see on on Thanksgiving because it's going to deliver really big audiences. And if if you brought in a better game, it wouldn't bring in really discernibly bigger audiences. Well, I think also Bears Lions, you look at, I think 26 million people watch that. 26 million watch that dog of a game. And I, I also think when you look at it before the season, if you obviously have the Lions and the Cowboys are in those afternoon slots on Thanksgiving because uh, of tradition, and the Lions are pretty much terrible every year. But if you said Bears, uh, you know, the Bears are a big draw. We didn't know they were going to be bad this year, and, and they've been terrible. But you always have the Lions. So I guess the point is, is that, until something changes in Detroit, you're always going to have at least one really bad team. The Cowboys are always a big draw. And when they're good, I mean, the Cowboys are TV gold. They're probably the most valuable franchise to have on TV uh, in at least American sports, uh, because if they're good, uh, I don't think there's anybody, you know, in baseball, you have the Yankees who are clearly superior, but they're not the level in terms of audience, national audience, I uh, think the Cowboys are. Um, so now we move on to our favorite topic, Amazon. Tell me how they're going to take over the sports industry, Andrew. Well, I mean, I listen, I've reported this way back when, maybe September, that Amazon and NFL Network, I'm hearing some more rumblings about Amazon and NFL Network, and uh, the NFL is trying to sell 49% uh, of NFL Network and Amazon um, being the one. Now, not done deal, not reporting that, still the thing that could happen. Here's my question for you, John, because you're big in this space and, you know, cables about the die and the whole thing and the end of the world, regional sports networks. Amazon gets the NFL network. What is that a good thing? Like what, 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 what do you make of that? If that were to happen? Look, Amazon's already been dabbling in linear television. They're a part owner of, of yes network in New, in New York. And this will enable them to, uh, to control a linear network. It will enable them to have a relationship with the NFL, which they especially want because they want better games uh, exclusively on, on Amazon on, on Thursday night. Um, and plus, Cable subscribers are not going to zero. Moffitt Nathanson put out a, a research report this week suggesting that they're going to go down to, you know, 53 million homes will we'll get pay TV. They'll all be big sports fans. And that's kind of the floor that you should expect for something like NFL Network. The idea, though, is that the NFL is not going to sell the NFL Network 
100% to Amazon, you know, they're going to sell a stake in the NFL network. It's possibly not even going to be a controlling stake. Uh, what I'm hearing is that Amazon is still one of several different companies that are kicking the tires. I, what I've heard is I'm not quite sure, I'm not quite ready to, to declare them a front runner yet, although they are certainly being aggressive and they, they certainly do want it. Uh, and something should happen by no later than March next year. Is that jiving with what you're hearing? Yeah, and have you heard others? I've heard one other that uh, we always hear about is Apple. Uh, could they be involved in this? Could you see Apple or is there somebody else that you want to mention? If not, you don't have to. But. The, the NFL always wants Apple. <laughs> Every sports league is dying for this deep pocketed Apple to get in and finally, finally bid on sports. I'll believe that when I see it. I heard that there were a couple of uh, already existing NFL uh, partners uh, w one of them, I don't know which one it is, but everybody has kicked the tires on this. Gotcha. All right. Well, the NFL Network, that's supposed to happen forever. Still hasn't. So until it does, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those uh, we'll wait and see. Now, Amazon, we get into Troy Aikman, Chris Collinsworth. Um, as we speak, I'm working on a column on this. should be out. You can probably read it when you can hear this podcast. Amazon is strong, going hard after Al Michaels. That's likely going to happen. But Al likes to work with top-notch uh, analysts and experienced analysts. So, you know, I think Collinsworth would probably be his number one choice. That's what he works with on Sunday. Collinsworth is on the verge of signing a new deal with NBC. He's going to get paid about $12.5 million. Again, Romo effect, big raise. I'm not sure where Collinsworth was exactly. but Romo effect, Andrew, but not Romo money. Not Romo, nobody's getting Romo money on one contract. However, here's the deal. You could have a $20 million analyst if Collinsworth or Aikman, I think Aikman would be more likely, does Thursday night along with their Sunday job on uh, for Collinsworth with NBC, for Aikman with Fox. They did both jobs, getting the double digits on both. You could have a $20 million analyst. Now, granted, um, you talk to people who do this, they say, yeah, he's working twice as hard. It's too two gigs to get to that 20 million, but that's still a lot of dough uh, to do NFL games. Fred Goodell is going over the producer of Sunday night football, uh, you know, who also does NBC that deal's basically done. Uh, I think Goodell makes Michaels uh, willing to do it. And then if you can bring over a big time analyst, I think Drew Brees is the other guy that you have to consider if uh, uh, as, you know, a front runner, uh, no, I shouldn't say a front runner. He's behind, I think uh, Aikman and Collinsworth. Uh, but I do think Breeze could get it. And there, there obviously could be some wild cards. But I don't think Al really wants to break in somebody. I've been told that a number of times by a number of people. Well, I'm going to suggest to you that it's more than twice the amount of work. It's probably 2.5 times the amount of work because you're not going to be dealing with, you know, the Packers playing the Rams. You're going to be doing Jacksonville playing the Jets. Yeah, I mean, the, the package that's going directly to Amazon is going to be the worst package that the NFL puts out. It's going to be exactly like those cable packages that went to ESPN back in 2006, about 15 years ago. It's going to be exactly like the Turner cable, the ESPN cable package from 20 years ago. You know that or you think that? You think that? You don't think that the games are going to be? The Fox has gotten better games. Obviously, they shifted some games. Now, you don't think Amazon's going to get a little bit better games than uh, what we saw? You're saying, you know, that ter those terrible schedules. I think Amazon might get a little bit better. I would be surprised. It would go against everything the NFL has always done when, when they want to see these new platforms. They're, they're going to let, let them have a couple of games. Maybe they'll get one Dallas game, but, uh, but it would, it's going to be Dallas playing a, a, a really poor team. Listen, bottom line, as you have admitted now, Amazon's a big story. We'll continue <laughs> Hang on, I got a question for you. What are the odds that, that uh, let's say, Fox says to, to Troy Aikman, you want to do Amazon? Go do Amazon. We're going to promote somebody from within, to Like, we're going to get Greg Olson as our, as our number one analyst, get a little bit younger, and, and sort of move forward that way. They love Greg Olson. They also love Aikman. I don't think it's going – I think it will be amicable. Here's the other thing. Aikman has one more year on his contract, so he goes into next year. He'll have to – if he has the Amazon offer, if that does happen – He'll, he'll come to Fox and say, look, this is the offer. This is what I want to do. And they'll consider it. Um, you know, at the moment, they don't do, you know, Troy Aikman and Joe Buck don't do uh, weeks that they don't have a doubleheader. So they do Thursday and then they don't do Sunday if there's no doubleheader in that late big afternoon window. In theory, Aikman could come back and say, let me just do the late afternoon games uh, on those weeks like I do now and then do the playoffs and do the Super Bowl. And Fox might look at it and say, hey, we're going to pay you less then, but we're willing to do it. You're our guy. 
We like that. But I do also think that they feel confident in Greg Olson, who uh, has been very good, uh, showed a lot of potential. They do have a Super Bowl next year. But I, I don't know. I think Greg Olson might be up for it. So I, I don't think it's going to be some sort of um, tough negotiation. I don't know, Andrew. If I'm Pete Bavacqua of NBC Sports or Eric Shanks of Fox Sports, I would be reticent to letting my number one analyst double his workload I think back to when CBS had uh, Thursday Night Football and Phil Simms was doing Thursday night and Sunday afternoon, and all of a sudden, within two years, Phil Simms went from somebody that you know, nobody really tweeted about or nobody really talked about to, to being the focus of ire on social media just because he was overexposed in, in, in a big way. Yeah, no, that, that is true, and that's a very good point. Uh, but I do think he and Nance didn't get along at that point as they kept going uh, with Sims and Nance on those shows, but he was overexposed. And I think that's an issue. That's why I think Collinsworth likely from what I've been told, doesn't do it. Um, he also has the pro football focus that takes up a lot of his time. So I think it's a better chance Aikman does it. I do think there's a little maybe cowboy rivalry with Romo. He's always kind of been the big brother to Romo, more successful. He's been a broadcast for 20 years. And then you see Romo making 18 per year and Troy, you know, is at that, you know, before you get added to Thursday, I think he was in the six and a half, seven range. Now he's, you know, closer to, I think, you know, eight, nine, 10 range. Uh, so I do think he sits there and be like, I'm a hall of famer. I got the Super Bowl rings. I've been doing this 20 years. Why is Romo making so much more money? You know, at the end of the day, he might say, I don't want to do double the work. And if I'm him, maybe I just say, hey, look, I'll take 12 million, 12 and a half million like Collinsworth is getting from NBC and just do uh, Fox's games and, and be done with it. To me, that's what makes sense for me. I'm not Troy Aikman, so I will, we'll see what, what he ends up doing. All right. Topic two. ESPN distribution and ACC network. John, your wheelhouse. ESPN distribution. We saw the numbers. Give them to us. Tell us what it means. This theme is about, the topic two's theme, it's about distribution. Are you ready? People are cutting the cord, Andrew, and, and it, it's happening in real time. And finally, ESPN, which has been stuck around 80 million homes, about 80 million homes in the, in the United States get ESPN. It's now, they told, uh, they had put out a report that said it's actually down around 75 million homes uh, that get ESPN. Why does this matter? Well, they have all of these rights deals, and all of these rights deals are predicated to going to the most people. It's not the most popular uh, network out there, but it certainly has sort of the most fervent fan base of networks out there. If they start dropping down, how far will it go? And that's the biggest question all of my sources are asking right now. Uh, I, I referenced earlier a Moffat Nathanson report suggests it's gonna go down to 53 million uh, total pay TV households. So if that happens, ESPN faces a situation where it could be losing 30 million households over the, the next five years, which could be devastating, not necessarily for ESPN, but for the leagues that are depending on ESPN getting its, uh, get, getting its programming to the widest possible audience. Now, let me kitchen table it for me, okay? I talked to an executive the other day who said the cable companies, now their business is more about broadband and, and the person said to me, made a very good point to me, you know, how much would you pay for broadband, right? You'd pay almost anything, right? You, would, you have to have broadband. Uh, and the cable business and having these channels is not as important to them. And so they might play hardball. Where do you see that going for the consumer? Am I going to have to pay, a tr like for someone like me who has to have cable, who needs all the games and needs all the streaming, am I going to have to pay a million trillion dollars to keep my cable? And they're just going to keep to make up the difference of losing the subscriber base they're going to do it on my dime and they're going to charge me a lot. Or do you think it becomes a skinnier bundle and they try to keep more people? Where does that go in, in your eyes? I think that you're going to see a lot more flexibility. I think that you're going to see the cable operators and satellite distributors and networks like ESPN and Disney start to work together a lot more in order to, to make uh, to, to get a more cost effective bundle to keep people uh, paying and watching that bundle uh, so that it doesn't go down to zero. I think that where you're really going to see a problem is I think ESPN is fine. 
ESPN is connected to Disney, and Disney is going forward with the ABC broadcast network. It's going forward. If you have kids, it has a Disney channel. It has you know, free form if you have teenagers. It has a, a lot of networks. That is all, all the Fox Entertainment networks that I got, and it has all the ESPN networks. So they, they are a pretty good bit of video programming that's going forward. If you're a sports fan and you like your local teams, I, 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 like, I, I like the Orioles. I watch Masson in DC. Like Matt, there's no other channel with Masson that's going to keep me. That, that's going to keep that on the on the uh, the cable operator. They're pricing themselves out of the market. I think that you're seeing that right now with MSG. If you're if you're a Comcast subscriber in the New York market, you you're, you can't see MSG networks, and that's a, that's a deal that's not likely to come anytime soon because they're just not affiliated with any other big programming networks to help jam that on. So locally, it's going to be a big problem. But the national networks like uh, like Fox, like uh, ESPN, uh, like CBS, they're like Turner even, uh, they're going to be fine. But are you with me now? This is our first, I think, podcast. We talked about ESPN going direct to consumer within five years with the mothership. Are you with me? Are you going to join the, the forces? Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm totally not with you. I'm a cable guy. No, but you don't think they're going to go with you don't think ESPN is going to try to go direct to consumer. You're telling me all these numbers. They're, they're losing all these people. You're saying there's a floor They, you know, they say 53 million. I will take that as gospel. Uh, but if, how do you make up that 30 to, you know, 50 million that you just lost, you go to direct to consumer if you're going to keep those 53, no? Streaming services like ESPN plus, they need to be additive to the, to the, the, the channel, the linear channel that's in the cable bundle. If they take that linear channel and they, and I can just buy that by itself over, you know, along with ESPN plus, What's going to make me pay for cable? Like I don't need to pay for cable then. So they have to be really careful about what pro- programming you can see via the cable bundle and what programming they're going to stream. But I just want to point out one. But how I also need TNT. I also need Fox Sports to get all my sports. So I, there is a reason to to I, I could if I just want ESPN, yes, direct to consumer. But I want all these things. I can't miss anything. So you do kind of need cable overall. All right. Last thing on this topic to be. Uh, or not to be uh, ACC network. <laughs> ACC network. Uh, tell us the significance of they did a deal. That the ACC network story to me is the best possible story. I, everything that you're writing about. I mean, you might be right. Maybe they will go directing consumer. I don't think anybody really knows. I think it's a, a fun prediction to make. Um, ACC network. The Atlantic Coast Conference and ESPN decided to launch a linear network just as all the subscribers are going south. Like, God love them, they're successful. They just did a deal with Comcast. They're, they're in probably around 50 million households. Uh, they, they, they won't say how many households, but it's, judging by some of the other uh, college networks that are out there, um, you know, that's pretty significant. I, I just think the idea of launching a linear network in, uh, in you know, 2019, which is when ACC Network launched, goes against the whole grain of streaming and direct to consumer. And I just think it's a wild story. Yeah. So they're zigging when others are zagging. All right. All right. We move to topic three. MLB spending spree for free agency and TV. John, listen, you've been saying the sky is falling with regional sports networks. All I see. Now I know Steve Cohen, the owner of the Mets has more money than anybody, $14 billion or so. Uh, and that, that's a big part of the spending. But I'm seeing spending, spending, spending. Do you think, you, you know, you've talked about it. You think the lockout, uh, what's going on with the players, the owners are very worried about the TV uh, side of things. How, what, what are you seeing, you know, what we just saw, all the spending on free agencies, on free agency, but also where we're going with this lockout? What I find interesting about the, the, the spending on free agency, uh, again, I'm coming from the Baltimore, D.C. market. Like, there's a hot stove there's league no spending. right now. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> like, like the, tell me about this hope that Mets fans seem to have r- right now. I don't know anything about that, Andrew. Um, I, it's not every club that is out there spending right now, uh, and, and it, it, it is clubs that are sort of in bigger markets. At, and you know, something somebody like the Mets are competing against the Yankees. They need they, they need to bring bring some uh, you know some good players in to try to get some some wins. It, so prediction time. Almost certainly, I think you agree with this, that there's going to be a, a lockout this week at some point. Would you agree? People listening probably already know there's a lockout, right? Yeah. I think 
that by opening day, they're still going to be at odds. I, I just... You're pushing it back. And before previous podcast, you said we'll be playing, I think, opening day. Or you said... No, no, no. I said, I, I, I said uh, they'll be playing this season, but I, I don't think that the, we're, they're going to have a traditional opening day. Oh. And I'm, I'm, sticking, I'm sticking with that. I just think they're... Right, right now, despite all the spending, like apparently the owners aren't that poor anymore, a Andrew. Despite all the spending, the, 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 if you just look out, the local revenue that they're going to make from their media rights is not going to be there. It's going down. Everybody can see that. Like, and, and, uh, and I think that, that that's the big problem. The players don't see that or don't want to see that, or the players believe that the owners already got rich and fat off this, and now they, they can take some of the, those proceeds. And it's a, that is a tough uh, bridge to pass. Well, and also why sports media is so important in all of this. You know, about a year ago, Joel Sherman and I reported about ESPN's deal, their new deal, uh, where the playoffs will be expanded from uh, 12 teams to 14 teams. Uh, and, you know, ESPN, I think, will pay a couple hundred more million dollars to do that. I don't think the players don't want it. It's probably not great for the regular season. The players' feeling is if you make it so easy to make the playoffs, then teams are going to be de incentivized to spend money and be good because, you know, you can win 78 games and maybe make the playoffs, 81 games will make the playoffs. Uh, and so that's not good, but I do think that will be pushed through. The owners want that extra couple hundred million dollars divvied up each year between 30 teams. Uh, so that's something that, you know, sports media TV is an overlay of this. Uh, uh, negotiation between the players and the owners. Yeah, and even though I, I am very sky is falling, as I think you are on, on the local rights, nationally, the, the Major League Baseball did very well with it. its most re recent deal with Fox, most recent deal with, uh, with Turner, both of which were up. Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but more than 50% in both cases. ESPN uh, took a little bit of a rollback, but they also got less programming as well. Yeah, there's definitely an iceberg going. Okay, we moved to topic four. Sean McManus has been at CBS for a quarter century. Congratulations to him on a tremendous run. Uh, now, first, I have to say this. John did a story on McManus, and I thought it was good that he had the wherewithal not to mention that he walks on water. I mean, I mean could the story be more positive? It was a profile. It was a profile. <laughs> no, it was very good. Very good. And give McManus credit. 25 years. You, you did a great job of telling and i'll let you explain it because uh you did it it was your story but telling where cbs sports was when sean got there where it is now uh quarter century doesn't sound like he's going anywhere i i'd heard the rumors about retirement too that you mentioned the story and he is not going anywhere why would you what a fun job well yeah andrew this goes back to the 2015 season uh the nfl season to me that was uh, the, cbs had the super bowl 50 uh, it was in san francisco san jose area and everybody uh, took a look at Sean McManus and said, like, what a perfect way to cap a, uh, what, what really was a stellar career uh, for McManus. And there were these rumors that he was going to retire. He had uh, David Burson had already been promoted to, to a CBS Sports president. So he had sort of his you know, lieutenant that was re ready to step in. And it was a very big rumor uh, that didn't happen. Well, now he's been there for 25 years. And so the, these rumors started coming again. Well, 25 years, it's a nice round number. He's going to step away. Well, in doing this profile, I spent, I spent some time with Sean. And you know, I asked him every possible way to ask him this question. And he has, he's 66 years old. He has no intention of walking away anytime soon. He's doing this at least for another five years. And after that five years, he's going to take a look and, and see. And uh, after what he's done with CBS, I think he should. He came to CBS back in uh, 1997. And when he came there, CBS had lost the Olympics. They lost Major League Baseball. They lost the NBA. They lost the NFL. They, CBS Sports basically had no sports. I, I think they had, they had the Masters. And it was up to Sean to come in. He came in, and he got the NFL back in, in uh, 1998, got the AFC package from NBC and just has really built up um, you know, CBS Sports to where the leagues like them. He's, uh, the, the, I mean, this is not just about Sean either. It's about CBS Sports. They're well-respected in the leagues. I mean, you talk to agents and you talk to talent. Talent there is very happy. Very rarely do you see talent that's sort of up and leaving. 
they just built this nice piece of sports media right here, right, right in New York. And I just thought, thought that that was a, a good story to tell. Yes. And the nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize will be... Uh, <laughs> no, no, congratulations to Sean. 25 years. It's, it's an amazing run. Very good piece. Uh, I enjoyed it immensely. And I'm sure all the McManus did as well. You know, Andrew, I'm, I'm feeling old now. I'm talking about Sean from 1997. I referenced John Miller in 1991, for goodness sakes. I, let's, uh, let's get more current. We got to get the kids. <laughs> all right. So let's finish it up with our calls of the week. Call of the week. John, I'm going to let you go first. And uh, going flashing back, I think from last week, uh, coming back to, to our uh, a big story. Yeah, no surprise. I, I love Dickie V, Dick Vitale. We all know that he's battling cancer, but let's listen to a snippet from his first broadcast back uh, right before he was going to call the Gonzaga UCLA game number one versus number two. On October 12th, Obi, I'll be honest with you, when they walked in and told me I had cancer, they thought it was bile duct cancer, and it was really going to be a serious surgery and all. I never dreamt at 82 that I'll ever be on courtside again, but to be here today, I'm sorry. I hope I don't cause a problem out there, but I, I feel so emotional. Don't apologize for anything. Well, and the game is the big thing. So let's get this game going. <laughs> Talk some basketball, the best. really. I, that was great. And then just two days later, uh, there was Dick uh, Vital again across the country in Orlando calling one of the biggest upsets so far in the college basketball season when Dayton beat the number four uh, Kansas Jayhawks. Let's listen to Dick there. They're looking to hit the drive the basketball. And there he goes. Here he They're goes. The drive the, the basketball. basketball. Oh. Oh. They get it back, though. They get Up it back. Seal oh. for the win. Oh, oh. 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 Look at the bad look! Look at the bad look! I can't believe it! I can't believe it, boom! I can't believe it, boom! Wow! You know, Andrew, I don't have much to say to, to that. Everybody knows Dick Vitale. I, I just think he, what the way he uh, comes on screen and the way he bears his personality uh, to, to to the viewing audience and the way he, you know, that's that excitement. It doesn't sound genuine, but it is genuine. That's the way he is, and I, I just think he has been able to connect with viewers and those uh, throughout his career. And those two snippets to me just show exactly why. Yeah, a great moment for Vital. And it's the passion that he brings uh, to, to the games and to life. And it's contagious uh, to, you know, to hear him and to be around him. All right, what's your call? My call of the week is also from ESPN, and it comes from NFL Countdown. I love genuine moments. Uh, I think, especially on TV, especially with former players, it doesn't always have to be like, we're journalists, because they're not. And Randy Moss, one of the great receivers of all time, on an NFL countdown this past weekend on Sunday, his son, Thaddeus Moss, uh, got activated by the Bengals. Number 81 for the Cincinnati Bengals. <laughs> yeah. oh, 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 the Bengals with his old QB, Joe Burrow, today against the Steelers, who, by the way, defense didn't look so hot last week, so it could be a big Let day for your boy. Phone. All right, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Who they? Let's get it. We normally try to at least pretend to be neutral. We are not neutral about this one at all. We'll be know. rooting for number 81 there. And, and the reason that I like it is pretty obvious. I mean, just a, what a great moment uh, for Randy and his son. And it just, you just love to see that. It's just genuine. Uh, and, you know, I think it's one thing to ha to accomplish something, but to see your son uh, or daughter accomplish something, uh, it's, it's probably even greater, uh, even if you're Randy Moss. Uh, so that was a special moment on Countdown. Yeah, there's a theme to our things. You said the word genuine. That, that was that was Randy Moss. That was Dick Vitale. Just genuine. And when you act, when you are genuine, you connect with the viewers. All right. Well, we try to be genuine on this podcast. We do the best we can. Uh, we do appreciate everyone listening and um, subscribing and uh, following the podcast and uh, tell a friend, review, do all those things. Next week, we're scheduled to have Steve Bornstein former head of ESPN, NFL broadcasting, legend in the business. Looking forward uh, to presenting that next week and talking about all the subjects, who's up, 
who's down, uh, the calls of the week, and all the topics. So uh, we will see you next week. Thanks for listening.